Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I am back with the Swiss Family Robinson, and we are in the middle of Chapter 2, A Desolate Island. And this book takes a little bit longer to read because it's older language, and so we are reading parts of the sections because the chapters are quite long. So the last time we left them, they were just getting to... Um, they were getting to the desolate island that they're trying to find provisions on. And mom had set herself up as a cook with little France to help her. That's where we left off last time. He, thinking his mother was melting some glue for carpentering, was eager to know what Papa was going to make next. This will be soup for your dinner, my child. Do you think these cakes look like glue? Yes, indeed I do, replied France, and I should not much like to taste glue soup. Don't you want some beef or mutton, Mama? Where can I get it, dear, said she. We are a long way from a butcher's shop, but these cakes are made of the juice of good meat, boiled until it has become strong, stiff jelly. People take them when they go to sea, because on a long voyage they can only have salt meat which will not make nice, nice soup. Fritz, meanwhile, leaving a loaded gun with me, took another himself and went along the rough coast to see what lay beyond the stream. This fatiguing sort of walk, not only suiting Ernest Fancy, he sauntered down to the beach and Jack scrambled among the rocks searching for shellfish. I was anxious to land the two casks which were floating alongside our boat, but on attempting to do so I found that I could not get them up the bank on which we had landed and was therefore obliged to look for a more convenient spot. As I did so I was startled by hearing Jack shouting for help as though in great danger. He was at some distance and I hurried toward him with a hatchet in my hand. The little fellow stood screaming in a deep pool, and as I approached, I saw that a huge lobster had caught his leg in its powerful claw. Poor Jack was in a terrible fright. Kick as he would, his enemy still clung on. I wandered into the water, and seizing the lobster firmly by the back, managed to make it loosen its hold, and we brought it safely to land. Jack, having speedily recovered his spirits and anxious to take such a prize to his mother, caught the lab lobster in both hands, but instantly received such a severe blow from its tail that he flung it down and passionately hit the creature with a large stone. This display of temper vexed me. You are acting in a very childish way, my son, said I, Never strike an enemy in a revengeful spirit. Once more lifting the lobster, Jack ran triumphantly toward the tent. Mother, mother, a lobster. Ernest, look here, France. Mind, he'll bite you. Where's Fritz? All came crowding round Jack and his prize, wondering at its unusual size, and Ernest wanted his mother to make lobster soup directly by adding it to what was now boiling. She, however, begged to decline making any such experiment and said she preferred cooking one dish at a time. Having remarked that the scene of Jack's adventure afforded a convenient place for getting my casks on, score, on shore, I returned thither and succeeded in drawing them up on the beach, where I set them on end and for the present left them. On my return, I resumed the subject of Jack's lobster and told him he should have the offending claw all to himself when it was ready to be eaten, congratulating him on being the first to discover anything useful. As to that, said Ernest, I found something very good to eat, as well as Jack, only I could not get at them without wetting my feet. Pooh, cried Jack. I know what he saw. Nothing but some nasty mussels. I saw them too. Who wants to eat trash like that? Lobster for me. I believe them to be oysters, not mussels, returned Ernest calmly. 
be good enough, my philosophical young friend, to fetch a few specimens of these oysters in time for our next meal, said I. We must all exert ourselves, Ernest, for the common good, and pray never let me hear you object to wetting your feet. See how quickly the sun has dried Jack and me. I can bring some salt at the same time, said Ernest. I remarked a good deal I remarked a good deal lying in the crevices of the rocks. It tasted very pure and good, and I concluded it was produced by the evaporation of seawater in the sun. Extremely profitable, learned sir, cried I. But if you had brought a bag full of this good salt instead of merely speculating so profoundly on the subject, it would have been more to the purpose. Run and fetch some directly. It proved to be salt, sure enough, although so impure that it seemed useless till my wife dissolved and strained it when it became fit to put in the soup. Why not use the sea water itself? asked Jack, because, said Ernest, it is not only salt but bitter too. Just try it. Now, said my wife, tasting the soup with this, with the stick, with which she had been stirring it. Dinner is ready. But where can Fritz be? She continued a little anxiously. How are we to eat our soup when he does come? I asked. We have neither plates nor spoons, and we can scarcely lift the boiling pot to our mouths. We are in as uncomfortable a position as was the fox to whom the stork served up a dinner in a jug with a long neck. Oh, for a few coconut shells, sighed Ernest. Oh, for half a dozen plates and as many silver spoons, rejoined I, smiling. Really, though, oyster shells would do, said he, after a moment's thought. True, that is an idea worth having. Off with you, my boys, get the oysters and clean out a few shells. What thought... What though our spoons have no handles, and we do burn our fingers a little in bailing the soup out. Jack was away and up to his knees in the water, in a moment detaching the oysters. Ernest followed more leisurely, and still unwilling to wet his feet, stood by the margin of the pool and gathered in his handkerchief the oysters his brother threw him. As he thus stood, he picked up and pocketed a large mussel shell for his own use. As they returned with a good supply, we heard a shout from Fritz in the distance. He, we returned it joyful, and he presently appeared before us, his hands behind his back, and a look of disappointment upon his countenance. Unsuccessful, said he. Really, I replied. Never mind, my boy. Better luck next time. Oh, Fritz, exclaimed his brothers, who had looked behind him. A sucking pig, a little sucking pig. Where did you get it? How did you shoot it? Do, you, do let us see it. Fritz then, with sparkling eyes, exhibited his prize. So he was tricking them, wasn't he? I am glad to see the results of your prowess, my boy, said I. But I cannot approve of deceit, even as a joke. Stick to the truth in jest and earnest. Fritz then told us how he had been to the other side of the stream. So different from this, he said, it is really a beautiful country, and the shore, which runs down to the sea in a gentle slope, is covered with all sorts of useful things from the wreck. Do let us go and collect them. And, Father, why should we not return to the wreck and bring off some of the animals? Just think of what value the cow would be to us, and what a pity it would be to lose her. Let us get her on shore, and we will move over the stream where she will have good pasturage, and we shall be in a shade instead of on this desert. And, Father, I do wish. Stop, stop, my boy, cried I. All will be done in good time. Tomorrow and the day after will bring work of their own. And tell me, did you see no trace of our shipmates? Not a sign of them, he replied. But the sucking pig, said Jack, where did you get it? It was one of several, said Fritz, which I found on the shore. Most curious animals they are. They hopped rather than walked, and every now and then would squat down on their legs and rub their snouts with their forepaws. Had not I been afraid of losing them, I would have tried to catch one alive. They seemed so tame. 
Meanwhile, Ernest had been carefully examining the animal in question. This is no pig, he said, and except for its bristly skin, does not look like one. See, its teeth are not like those of a pig, but rather those of a squirrel. In fact, he continued, looking at Fritz, your sucking pig is an agouti. Dear me, said Fritz, listen to the great professor lecturing. He is going to prove that a pig is not a pig. You need not be so quick to laugh at your brother, said I in my turn. He is quite right. I, too, know the agouti by descriptions and pictures, and there is little doubt that this is a specimen. The little animal is a native of North America, where it makes its nest under the roots of trees and lives on fruit. But Ernest, the agouti is not only not only looks something like a pig, but most decidedly grunts like a porker. While we were thus talking, Jack had been vainly endeavoring to open an oyster with his large knife. Here is a simpler way, said I, placing an oyster on the fire. It immediately opened. Now, I continued, who will try this delicacy? All at first hesitated to partake of them. So unattractive did they appear. Jack, however, tightly closing his eyes and making a face as though about to take medicine, gulped one down. We followed his example, one after another, each doing so rather to prov provide himself with a spoon than with any hope of cultivating a taste for oysters. So they're trying to get their eating utensils from the oyster shells. Our spoons were now ready, and gathering around the pot, we dipped them in, not, however, without sundry scalded fingers. Ernest then drew from his pocket the large shell he had procured for his own use, and scooping up a good quantity of soup, he put it down to cool, smiling at his own foresight. So he's going to cool his soup before he eats it. Prudence should be exercised for others, I remarked. Your cool soup will do capitally for the dogs, my boy. Take it to them, and then come and eat like the rest of us. Ernest winced at this, but silently taking up his shell, he placed it on the ground before the hungry dogs, who lapped up its contents in a moment. He then returned, and we all went merrily on with our dinner. While we were thus busily employed, we suddenly discovered that our dogs, not satisfied with their mouthful of soup, had espied the agouti and were rapidly devouring it. Fritz, seizing his gun, flew to rescue it from their hungry jaws, and before I could prevent him, struck one of them with such force that his gun was bent. The poor beast ran off howling, followed by a shower of stones from Fritz, who shouted and yelled at them so fiercely that his mother was actually terrified. I followed him, and as soon as he would listen to me, rep represented to him how de despicable as well as wicked was such an outbreak of temper. For, said I, you have hurt, if not actually wounded, the dogs. You have distressed and terrified your mother, and spoiled your gun. Though Fritz's passion was easily aroused, it never lasted long, and speedily recovering himself, immediately he entreated his mother's pardon and expressed his sorrow for his fault. By this time the sun was sinking beneath the horizon, and the poultry, which had been straying to some little distance, gathered around us and began to pick up the crumbs of biscuit which had fallen during our repast. My wife hereupon drew from her mysterious bag some handful of oats, peas, and other grain, and with them began to feed the poultry. She at the same time showed me several other seeds of various vegetables. That was indeed thoughtful, said I, but pray be careful of what will be of such value to us. We can bring plenty of damaged biscuits from the wreck, which, though of no use as food for us, will suit the fowls as well, indeed. The pigeons now flew up to crevices in the rocks, and the fowls perched themselves on our tent pole, and the ducks and the geese waddled off, cackling and quacking, to the marshy 
margin of the river. We too were ready for repose, and having loaded our guns and offered up our prayers to God, thanking Him for His many mercies to us, we commended ourselves to His protecting care, and as the last ray of light departed, closed our tent and lay down to rest. The children remarked the suddenness of nightfall, for indeed there had been little or no twilight. This convinced me that we must not be far from the equator, for twilight results from the refraction of the sun's rays. The more obliquely these rays fall, the farther does the partial light extend, while the more perpendicularly they strike the earth, the longer do they continue their undiminished force, until, when the sun sinks, they totally disappear, thus producing sudden darkness. Wow, that was a lot of science in one paragraph, wasn't it? Okay, so they're near the equator because the sun goes down very, very quickly and there's nothing, um, there's not much warning that the sun is about to be gone. Okay, so that is the end of chapter two. And I hope you're enjoying this book as much as I am. It's a little difficult to read. I have to stumble a little bit every once in a while, but it is a very, very good book. And just think of this book is full of very descriptive language of what they're finding, isn't it? So it makes it very interesting to me because although I'm very grateful that I don't have to go to such lengths to get my supper, it is very interesting to read, isn't it? So, next time we will read chapter three. We explore our island. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.